Okay, so we're in a series now, officially, I guess. Uh, when you get, you know, two, three weeks into it, then you realize it's, it's probably going to be with us for a while. <laughs> and uh, um, this is, uh, when everything goes wrong, the adventure begins. Although in my absence, I hear they took out the, so it's when everything goes wrong, adventure begins, which... <laughs> I don't have to go along with that, do I? <laughs> that was my idea. So, um, so anyway, um, so I was thinking about this, and I thought, you know, right at the beginning, we have a tension in our lives between um, wanting to appear like everything's working out well, and you know, we have a certain amount of prosperity, and uh, we've got issues, but we're handling them really good, you know, and so we have that uh, that pressure inside to appear uh, together, pretty much. And then there's the other side of the wondering if we can hold it together one more one more minute, or what if we get found out for who we really are. And, and this tension plays out in our lives. And, and for me personally, I thought most of my life, as soon as I can get it together, the adventure will begin. You know, I'll be ready to go as soon as I work out this stuff, solve this, take care of that, handle it, and, and then I'm ready to follow Christ by faith and go forward with him, trusting him for whatever comes, because I've got everything taken care of. Do you know how long I waited <laughs> to follow Christ and to trust him? Because it was like I was saying, you know, John, if you get it all together like that before you follow me, that means you don't need faith. Because you've got it all together before you follow me. And so you only need faith if it's all falling apart around you and you're still walking with me. That's where the adventure comes. And I realized, oh, how many times do I get this wrong? Uh, I get it backwards. And, and so, uh, so I've been trying to come to grips with what it means to um, recognize that everything has gone wrong and now the adventure is beginning. And um, I, for our scripture today, I'm looking at 2 Corinthians chapter 6, which obviously is a well-used portion of the Bible because the, the pages are shredding on me here. I'm not asking for sympathy, I'm just pointing it out. Uh, and uh, the Apostle Paul uh, has visited with the church in Corinth and uh, began the church in Corinth. And then um, as he went off on his ministries, word got back to them that he was kind of a loser and that he wasn't a very good pastor and obviously uh, didn't have the gifts he thought he had and maybe they shouldn't trust him. And so he writes back to them and um, to kind of make the case of why, why they could trust him. And he does an interesting thing. He says in, in uh, chapter six, we put no stumbling block in anyone's way so that our ministry will not be discredited. See, what discredits a ministry? It's um, if you present it one way, then people find out the real truth, that it's something else, right? And then it loses its credibility. So he says, I don't want the ministry to be uh, discredited. Rather, as servants of God, we commend ourselves in every way, in great endurance, in troubles, hardships, and distresses, in beatings, imprisonments and riots in hard work sleepless nights and in hunger that's how we commend ourselves I'm thinking what in the world what kind of a job application does that look like and then he goes also in verse 6 in purity understanding patience and kindness in the Holy Spirit and in sincere love, in truthful speech and in the power of God, with weapons of righteousness in the right hand and in the left, through glory and dishonor. Bad report and good report. Genuine, yet regarded as imposters. Known, yet regarded as unknown. Dying, Yet we live on. Beaten, not killed. Got that going for me. <laughs> Sorrowful, yet always rejoicing. Poor, yet making many rich. Having nothing, yet possessing everything. 
And then he says this, we have spoken freely to you, Corinthians, and open wide our hearts to you. We're not withholding our affection from you, but you are withholding yours from us. As a fair exchange, open wide your hearts also. Well, Lord, teach us from this. Teach us how we can live, how we can follow you, and how we can experience the adventure that, uh, that faith can be. That's our, that's our need today, in Jesus' name, amen. Now, I look at this passage, and I'm stunned by it, because of the incredible honesty. If you were trying to present yourself uh, to win approval, is that what you would say about your life? But everything except the riots, probably you could say about your life. Well, no, maybe some of you had, had the riots. Uh, but um, what he's saying is, if you want to see my life, my life in Christ, my life in ministry, this is what it is. This and this and this and this and this and this and this. It's all of it. We don't have to be ashamed of any of it. We don't have to hide any of it. We don't have to pretend some of it's not there and just project the other. We, we get the whole thing because Christ meets us in all of that and he uses all of that. Not just the parts that we wish we could hold up. Right? That's so important. That's so important to us because um, it goes against this uh, pressure uh, I mean, when I grew up thinking about the church, I, I always felt like I didn't belong in it. Uh, probably didn't, but um, because everybody was so wholesome. Uh, their, their parents had good jobs and their moms could cook. You know, my mom couldn't cook. When I was in, I think, 10th grade, I took over the cooking for the family because I couldn't stand it any longer. It was just a personal thing, you know. And uh, sorry, mom. <laughs> But um, it's true. <laughs> and uh, our family didn't uh, get along all that well. You know, uh, we fought. We, we fist fights with the parents, uh, all of it, you know. And uh, we're pretty, pretty assertive. <laughs> yeah. and, uh, and then we'd go to church. And on the way in, we'd hear, now, you better not see anything. You better not see you, you kids. You you keep quiet when you go in there. You know, don't tell anything. And whatever you do, don't scream or cry before we get there. You know? And so it was just, that's what it was. And so we felt like, wow, everybody else has it so together. And I always felt like that in church. You know, as a pastor, and I'd look out and I'd go, this is the group of the people who have it together. They've really perfected it. If only I could be more like y'all. Then I realized I am like y'all, you know, and now I have to pray for you too. You know? <laughs> but, but the thing is, uh, there, there was the difference between the image and the real thing. And Paul back here is saying, you can't, you can't get any goods on me because I'm telling you up front. You know, uh, gossip ends when we start telling the truth about each other, right? There's no need for gossip because there's no secrets. And so he said, let me tell you, oh man, wow, all that and more. And, and so I thought, this is someone who says, I knew what I was getting into when I followed Christ. And remember how Paul was converted. He was the strong one, the aggressive one. He was defending his faith, and he was going to kill all the Christians, and he had his orders to do it. And then he meets Jesus, goes blind, falls on his rear end on the ground, and is led away into town, a broken, lost man, needing others, and... Everything went wrong on that little trip, didn't it? It was a Westfall trip. And, uh, and that's how he began. So he knew, if I'm going to follow Christ, it'll probably be when everything goes wrong. That's when I'm following him. Not when everything is just perfect. Although I'll follow him then too. Now, he comes this towards the end of his ministry, and he comes and he says, okay, let me just tell you the whole thing. This is what I signed up for. Isn't that a, a positive affirmation? I, saw, I knew what I was getting into. I knew from the beginning this was going to be rugged. That's okay. But it reminded me of, a, of a, a couple who came to see me a few years ago, and I had done their wedding years before. You know, when the thing about being an old pastor is, you know, 
You do their weddings and then you see them as adults later on. <laughs> Don't recognize them all that much. But uh, so they came to see me and were sitting in the office and they were having all kinds of trouble. They, they had uh, lost a, a baby in childbirth and this, the sadness of that and the grief of that and the loss was just eating away at them. She had health problems that just seemed to never end. And he had just lost his job and they were struggling. How do we make ends meet? Are we going to lose our house? All these kind of things. And um, we're sitting there and right in the middle of it, he says, you know, John, we did not sign up for this. This is not what we signed up for. And I thought for a minute and um, I went over to my files. I was this kind of four level, you know, the old crummy file cabinet. And I opened it up to the section of marriages and I had kept everybody's notes from their marriage counseling. And uh, I pulled out theirs and I said, well, you know, I've got here my notes from your wedding. Um, you said that you would um, love, honor, and be faithful in sickness and in health. in times of plenty and in times of want and in joy and in sorrow you did sign up for this <laughs> what are you sitting here telling me what is it what what you're saying to me is i'm gonna love and marry you and, and support you as long as we're happy and wealthy and well isn't that great? And I thought to myself a little bit, yeah, that's what I wanted too. I wanted that too. We didn't get any of it, right? But, but think about it. That's what we signed up for. But then when we get the other stuff, we don't want it. We go, something's wrong. i got to get out of this. This is not working. This is not the way I want it. And we do the same thing with our relationship to God where we say, Lord, I'm going to follow you. I'm going to trust you. Richer and poorer and sickness and health and all those things, joy and sorrow. And I'm going to follow you, Lord, all through life. And you're going to be with me. Oh, crud, I hate this stuff. Lord, where are you? You're gone, huh? Okay, well, I'm going my own way then. What? It's when everything goes wrong... That, the, that, that we need faith. It's when everything goes wrong that our relationship with Christ matters more. And when we start to see ourselves for, for who we are and why we know that we need the Lord. And the people around us know we need the Lord because they see us in, the, in that situation. Yeah, it's funny. I get weird comments, but on, on, I was checking Amazon this week because uh, on the uh, Getting Past What You Never Get Over book, they have like reviews that people write. One review I got was anonymous, but it was the uh, wife of the pastor that got me out at um, Edina. <laughs> she put this little town in Texas, and I knew that that's where she grew up, where her mother lived. Uh -huh. <laughs> it was like Podunkville, Texas. But anyway, so I knew that. But anyway, so I got a new one this week, and, and the person with a sincere heart gave it a one star. And they said, I, I, don't, I, I don't even know if this is a book. <sighs> Dr. Westfall just seems to talk about all these bad experiences he's had in his life, and he doesn't handle them very well. <laughs> I thought that was so fabulous. Wow, she just doesn't get me. Uh, and, uh, and, and it's so funny because it's like, if you have all these experiences, why would you be writing uh, a book for the, in the first place? And secondly, you didn't handle them well. You still have stuff in your life. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and so uh, I had to laugh at it, you know, because I thought, yeah, some people only want either trouble free or it's all resolved in the past. And now I'm telling you how to how to do it, or how I did it successfully. And then mine was how I didn't do it successfully. <laughs> it's, it's kind of a non-help book. <laughs> you know? but, but anyway, I just thought that was so funny because it was like, he doesn't handle this well and he's got all these problems what um, but I think that's a little bit of what Paul's saying all this happened and the great stuff to incredible joy and grief and sorrowful poor um, and yet 
in the Holy Spirit, in sincere love, in truthful speech, in the power of God. That's how I live too, right? All of that. Now, when I think about this, I, I think of um, somebody who didn't get this right, and that was uh, back in Exodus, and um, the people of Israel, and they had an interesting um, deal going on. My pages are flipping weirdly. Let's start. God answers their prayers, and they're led out of um, Egypt, and they're led uh, towards the promised land, and Moses is leading them. Everything's super, right? Everything's great. And then uh, they come to the Red Sea, they're parked at the Red Sea, you know, and they can't get across. And then it says in verse 10 of chapter 14 of Exodus, uh, as Pharaoh approached, the Israelites looked up, and there were the Egyptians marching after them, and they were terrified, and they cried out, and they said to Moses, was it because there's no graves in Egypt that you brought us out here to die? <laughs> That's brilliant. Well, isn't that brilliant? <laughs> You know, we have graves. We could have died back there. We didn't have to come out here with you and die in the desert. <laughs> what have you done to us by bringing us out of Egypt? Didn't we say to you in Egypt, leave us alone. Let us serve the Egyptians. I would have been, it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than die in the desert with you. Okay, this is someone who uh, doesn't get it. Okay. Now I thought, well, you know, you can understand that because you know it's it's very foreboding, and they they don't see the, the way out, and, and I can understand how it could get that way, right? So then I read a little further, chapter sixteen, verse two. Now they're out. They've gone through the Red Sea. They've seen the miracle. God saved them. Everything is fine, right? They're just they're just trusting God in every way. And in the desert, the whole community, not just some, the whole community grumbled against Moses and Aaron. And the Israelites said to them, if only we had died by the Lord's hand in Egypt, meaning if God would have killed us there, that would have been so much better. There we sat around pots of meat, and we ate all the food we wanted, high cholesterol stuff, but you brought us out into the desert to starve the entire group of us to death. I didn't sign up for this. That's what they're saying, right? That's going to take a miracle. Well, you know, so then they get their miracle. And then I turn the page, and you're in chapter 17 now. They've had all these big miracles. 17, verse 3. But the people were thirsty for, for water. And they grumbled against Moses. And they said, why did you bring us out of Egypt to make us and our children and our livestock die? Now you're not just killing us, you're killing the kids and you're killing the cats and dogs, all of them. They're gonna die of thirst. And Moses cried out to the Lord, what am I gonna do with these people? <laughs> That's <a> every pastor's <laughs> prayer. <laughs> oh gosh, every pastor's prayer. And I thought, well, you know, that happens. But then, after 40 years, 40 years go by, and you think, well, okay, so they've seen God act, they've seen miracles, they've walked with Moses in here, and now they've got it figured out. They've got a rhythm to their life. They know that the Lord takes care of them every time they get into a problem. They know they're going to be fine, right? So I get to Numbers chapter 14, where they're about to uh, enter the promised land, and they've seen God work over and over through their lives. 40 years have gone by. And that night, all the people of the community raised their voices and wept aloud. All the Israelites, not, not a few, all the Israelites grumbled against Moses and Aaron. That's getting repetitious. And the whole assembly said to them, if only we had died in Egypt or in the desert, wouldn't that have been better? We could have died in the desert. Why is the Lord bringing us to this land only to let us fall by the swords? Our wives and children will be taken as plunder. Wouldn't it be better for us to go back to Egypt? And they said to each other, we should choose a real leader and go back to Egypt. Forget this Moses thing. Let's get a real leader who's going to take us where we want to go. And I'm looking at this and I'm going, it never ended. Right? It never ended. Every single circumstance. 
I didn't sign up for this. Actually, they didn't sign up for anything. God was leading them, and they didn't want to go. They didn't like where they were. They wanted to be rescued, but they wanted to be rescued with the, in joy and in wealth and in health. I promise, Lord, to serve you in joy and in times of wealth and in times of health and prosperity and when I'm really happy. Lord, that's when I'm going to serve you. So come on into my life and lead me in those times. Well, guess what? I hate to be the deliverer of good news. God goes, no, I'm going to be with you for the whole thing. I'm going to be with you both sides of it. When you think that it's not possible uh, to hang on, I'm going to be with you hanging on. And Jane gave me a book to read called Rivers of Sorrow, Currents of Hope. It's a prayer book for grieving, which I thought was interesting. But listen to a little thing, what it says here. The world felt solid and trustworthy until everything I counted on changed. Now I'm painfully aware that life moves. And it's the same with my emotions. Yesterday, I was filled with anger and my fury struck out at you. Why didn't your hand reach out to save everything I loved? But today I'm begging you not to leave me alone in this darkness. I hate this roller coaster of feelings. I feel splintered. I'm a, I'm a collection of fragments too small to piece together again. We know how that feels. Where is the Lord in this? Who are we in this? Do we, are we only one side of the equation or, or is our life the whole thing? I think sometimes in those hardest times, and I didn't trust me, I, you know, when I went through some really hard times, there were people around me who said, oh, you know, you're gonna look back on this and you're gonna be grateful. <laughs> Get the, out of my life. <laughs> that was edited for the video, thank you. <laughs> It wasn't good. But um, I found this interesting quote. Um, Alexander Solzhenitsyn, who was in the Gulag and the former Soviet Union for all those years, here's what he said. It was only when I lay there on rotting prison straw that I sensed within myself the first stirring of good. Gradually, it was disclosed to me that the line separating good and evil passes not through states, nor between classes, nor between political parties either. But it passes right through all human hearts. So, bless you, prison, for having been in my life. Now, I read that at first and I didn't understand it. Who would bless being in prison? That horrible life that he had there. But it was there that God got a hold of him. It was there that he discovered there's good and evil. And it went right through his heart. And he became a different person, even in the gulag. Now, does that mean I want us all to sign up to go into a gulag and uh, to, uh, our vacation with a purpose trip? You know? <laughs> no, but there are things in our life that we're, we're faced with coming to grips with who we are and what God wants to do in us. And I want us to say, when those things happen, I did sign up for this. I did sign up for this. I signed up to trust God through it all. I wish that I didn't have the all part, but I do right now. And he said, I'll never leave you or forsake you. I'll be with you to the very end. That's what I signed up for. If we can make that our prayer, we're free. We are completely free to trust him, to live freely, to not hide, to not pretend. Say, this is, what, this is my life, my life in Christ. Well, let me pray with this. Lord, we do belong to you, and, and we don't understand all the time. We don't understand some of the time, even. And, and Lord, we, we pray for 
victories and we pray for healing and we pray for uh, forgiveness and we pray for new beginnings and we pray for all of those things. And we pray that you would be victorious over anything that would pull us down or hold us back. But in the midst of it, Lord, we belong to you. So be present. Bring your healing. Bring your care. Bring your provision. Bring your protection. Bring your joy. And we'll give you the glory. Amen.